and blessings to our little ones as they make their way out and downstairs. Thankful for volunteers who are engaging with them. I wondered if you noticed Ken's statement of great faith as uh, he started this this morning. Anybody notice that? Pastor Scott has a wonderful message for us, he says. He has no clue what I've got ready for. <laughs> it's a statement of faith, and I appreciate it. Always good. Well, okay. Well, okay. Um, no pressure, but uh, nonetheless. My friend uh, David Ellers, who happens to be a deacon here for us at the Westfield Baptist, uh, sent us uh, or shared with some other guys and I a devotional uh, this week, and, and a couple of lines of it struck my attention. It was. Uh, came out of a devotional that uh, David Jeremiah shared, and he quoted a man, an author by the name of Jack Canfield. He says, Thanksgiving is the opposite of grumbling. Thanksgiving is the opposite of grumbling, the antithesis of fault-finding and the antidote for a complaining spirit. The Thanksgiving. We're going to read a section of scripture and work our way back toward it as we go along this morning. We're going to read from Luke chapter 17, starting in verse 11. <clears throat> While Jesus was on the way to Jerusalem, he was passing between Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered a village, ten leprous men who stood at a distance met him. And they raised their voices saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they were going, they were cleansed. Now one of them, when he saw that he had been healed, turned back, glorifying God with a loud voice. And he fell on his face at his feet, giving thanks to him. And he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus answered and said, Were there not ten cleansed? But the nine, where are they? Was no one found who turned to give glory to God except this Order. And he said to him, stand up and go. Your faith has made you well. Father, thank you for your word this morning. May it instruct us. May it challenge us as we think about your good work in our lives. And our tendency just to consume that good work without hesitating even long enough to say thanks. So, direct us from here to do differently in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanksgiving is the opposite of grumbling, Canfield said. And it immediately took me all the way back into the book of Exodus, where God's people had been held as slaves in Egypt for approaching 400 years. We haven't even been a nation for that long. And they had been held in slavery in Egypt for 400 years until God finally rolled all the cogs into place and sent Moses and said, it's time for my people to come out of Egypt. And he began to unfold these experiences of his power as God sent the plagues upon the Egyptians until finally that last one and Pharaoh threw up his hand and said, fine, get out of here. And off they went. Some have suggested as many as three million strong Israelites took off out of Egypt and headed toward the promised land. Land that had been promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob all those years before, and now it appeared it would be theirs. And they got right up to the edge of the Red Sea and suddenly realized the favor has changed his mind. <laughs> and all those thunderous chariots and the might of the Egyptian army coming in upon them. And God directed Moses and the sea opened up. And they went through on dry land and made it to the other side. And the Egyptians followed them in. As you know the story, the water came back and wiped them out. And, and oh, they sang and celebrated. That's all recorded for us in Exodus 14. They had just seen God 
miraculously manipulate millions of gallons of water. It just piled up on either side and made a way right through. Think about the last time you were by any substantial body of water and think about that just opening up to allow you to walk through on dry ground. Just try to visualize that. And in Exodus 15, they get on out into the desert that they had to pass through on the way to the promised land and they come to a place where there's some water and they can't drink it. It's bitter. And what do they do? Whoa. What did you do? Bring us out here? Were there no graves in Egypt where you could have buried us? Why did you bring us out here to die? And of all things, God instructs Moses, take a branch and throw in that water and it'll be fine. And sure enough, it was. And then just a little bit further, he took them to a place where there were wonderful springs of water. Well, that would have settled it, right? That would have, that would have cured them of their grumbling. One would have thought that the miraculous manipulation of millions of gallons of water at the Red Sea, they would have been all in with God. Setting aside the fact that he had shown his power through all the plagues <coughs> and brought them out, the parting of the Red Sea surely would have assured them that God's able. But then they find some bitter water and they start grumbling and growling at God. But now that he has shown them here, no, no, even the bitter waters, I can straighten that out, no worries. And I've got better things for you coming just around the corner. That would have ended that, right? That was Exodus 15. In Exodus 16, they're grumbling again. What are we going to eat? There's nothing out here to eat. And so yet again, God miraculously provides for them manna, call it, the bread of heaven to eat. And that's not even enough. And so he sends quail, you know, and meat for them to eat. Surely that would settle this grumbling issue. Surely God had shown them by now and they would have gotten it. I got you. You're going to be okay. Exodus 17, they're grumbling again. Water. We need water. So upset are the Israelites this time that Moses fears for his own life. <laughs> he thinks they're going to stone him. How could they have forgotten what God had already done? Why would they just have dismissed his faithfulness over and over and over again? Surely this time, as God once again provided miraculously water coming out of rock, you remember? But by the time we get to Numbers chapter 20, they're still grumbling. They want water again. And it was that set of circumstances that caused Moses himself to not accurately carry out God's instruction. He told him to speak to the rock, but instead he takes his staff and beats on that rock. And as a result, his disobedience caused him to sacrifice the opportunity to go into the promised land. You see, sometimes we think our grumbling just affects us, right? But not in this case. Numbers chapter 20, it took Moses out. Now, oh, be careful with the power of a grumbling tongue, my friends. Because you just never know who else it may influence, who else it may impact. A complaining heart, a fault-finding spirit. The opposite of that instead is the giving of thanks. Back in the early 1900s, the Archbishop of Canterbury was William Temple. He had this to say, it is probable that in most of us, the spiritual life is impoverished and stunted because we give so little place to gratitude, acknowledging how good it is 
that God has been to us over and over and over again. And yet, over and over and over again, when we encounter some difficult circumstances that make themselves known in our life, we are so prone to grow. <laughs> just to get crossways inside. As opposed to just saying, well, God, I may not know what you're up to, but there's good here. And this part may not be especially to my liking, but there's still plenty to be thankful for. Leprosy was a scourge of the day in Jesus' day. But once an individual had contracted it, they were ostracized and set apart for fear of its contagiousness. And they were put out of the city and they, they often would gather, as we saw in our text this morning, they would often gather in little groups, you know. Uh, 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 there, was no, there was no concern about catching it if you already had it. And so they would be together. And people didn't want anything to do with them. They they shun them and, and out of fear and, and and so it was a tough way to go you, you, you lost access to family and friends and, and, and so much of what we normally would take for granted obviously that meant too no access to the temple and all that surrounded their access to God And so as Jesus was coming along, and it's obvious that Jesus' reputation had preceded him as these ten leprous men recognized who it was that was coming, and they raised their voices and asked for mercy. Don't give us what we deserve, Jesus. Give us instead what we desperately need. And he said, go and show yourselves to the priests. Now that may seem a bit like a strange response to his plea for mercy. But if you look back in the law, which they were still very much living under at this point, that whenever one had been healed of such a thing, whenever that condition had passed, it was the priest who had the authority to declare all good. You can re-engage in public life. There's nothing to worry about. This guy's all clean. No problem. And so that's what Jesus is telling him to do. These ten men said, well, go and show yourselves to the priest. He'll, he'll make that public announcement that you are clean. And then notice, as they were going, they were clean. Not an uncommon thing that that step of faith, that willingness to, to, to proceed, believing that Jesus is able to do what he said he would do, comes first. A step of faith. As they were going, Jesus said, go show yourselves to the priest. They assumed that meant healing was on its way. Surely by the time or before we get there, we'll be all clear. And as they were going, they were cleansed. I, I don't, I don't, I don't know if there's any way for us to relate to what that would have meant to them. It's sort of like it's sort of like and yet not the same you know back in 2020 when you know you got the dreaded positive COVID test you know you had to hide away you know you were quarantined for five days or seven days or however long it was and 
oh, what a relief it was when you finally had cleared and you got the all good from the public health department that it was okay to re-engage in life again, you know? You could see people and you could be with people and you could, whatever it was you wanted to do again. But, but this was even different than that. Because everything changed with leprosy. I mean, everything. As they were going, they were cleansed. And then look, look what happens next. One of them, when he saw that he'd been healed, turned back, glorifying God with a loud voice. And then we see, fell on his face, at his feet, giving thanks to him. One of ten came back to say thank you first. And he was a Samaritan. I, Jesus delighted to make Samaritans heroes of his stories, you know. Because <laughs> they were sort of, they, they, they were persona non grata. You know, they, they, they were not looked at well by the Jewish people. They were half-breed Jews and it just was not a good thing but the hero of this story was the Samaritan. He was the one guy who recognized the gift that he had received and came back to say thank you. And Jesus said uh, hey, worth a ten? But the nine, where are they? Well, the nine are on their way to the priest to get the all clear so that they could enjoy the gift that they had received. They couldn't wait to get home to their families. They couldn't wait to re-engage with real life. They couldn't wait to consume what they'd been given to enjoy this gift of healing that they had been and they were all about it focused on man oh man I can't wait to and the natural thing is to think come on you guys surely you could take just a minute to say thanks but in an honest moment maybe we might have been among the nine where we simply consume the blessing without any acknowledgement of slowing down long enough to say thanks to the one who has provided the blessing. I don't know that Jesus intended it to be a, a lesson of percentages, but in his story, only 10%, only 10% delayed the consumption, the enjoyment of the blessing. And it would have been substantial. Only one of the 10 delayed the enjoyment of the blessing long enough to acknowledge the source of the blessing to slow down long enough to say thanks. I have two uh, historical accounts that I'll share with you. That it's possible even to be thankful in the midst of great difficulty. You know, even when there's lots of difficult stuff going on. You know, and I know we all have stuff. You know, we look out and we see a world that seems bound and determined to just constantly be at it, right? Just challenges abound. But 
that's not necessarily new. Later this week, we will all enjoy a, a day of Thanksgiving. <clears throat> yes, I'm thirsty. Um, let me remind you that that is a federal holiday <laughs> to which everybody gets the day off, right? Most everybody. I, we have medical workers in our family, so we know not everybody gets a day off. But <clears throat> the idea there. And that has been so since the fall of 1863 when President Abraham Lincoln pronounced a national day of thanksgiving. And we have celebrated that on the last Thursday of the month of November every year since. And he used words like these to make that pronouncement. He says it had seemed fitting, no, it had seemed to me fit and proper that the gracious gifts of the Most High God should be solemnly, reverently, and gratefully acknowledged as with one heart and one voice by the whole American people. <laughs> oh, for some national leadership that would acknowledge such things today, huh? And so he declared a day of thanksgiving and praise to our beneficent Father. That's why a Thursday is the day. But might I remind you that in 1863, our country was in the throes of a civil war. The future prospects of its survival were still uncertain. And in the midst of such a time, Lincoln directed us to take a step back, to take a day, to acknowledge the goodness of our God to us. Surely we can draw from that example in the most difficult circumstances of our own lives, there's always something to be thankful for. To slow down long enough to say, man, Lord, thanks. Yeah, I got some stuff going on. But wow, have you been good to me too. I'm grateful. Some years after that, in the early 30s, our country found itself in the throes of a Great Depression. And life was difficult in ways that a weak, vast majority of us did not experience, although we have heard about it. And the testimony of one man by the name of William Stringer survived he was seated one day with a group of friends in a restaurant and everyone was talking about the depression and how terrible it was, the suffering people, the rich people committing suicide, the jobless, the whole thing. And the conversation got more and more miserable as it went on. And there was a minister, a pastor in the group and he suddenly broke in and said this, I don't know what I'm going to do. Because in two or three weeks, I have to preach a sermon on Thanksgiving Day, and I want to say something positive. But what can I say that's affirmative in a period of world depression like this? And as the minister spoke, Stinger said it was like the Spirit of God spoke to him. Why don't you give thanks to those people who have been a blessing in your life and affirm them during this terrible time? I wonder who comes to your mind right now. Even in the midst of the difficult stuff that you're going through, and I can look around the room and I see it, I'm aware. But who are the people that have been a blessing in your life? So he began to think about that, Stringer said, and 
And, and it came to mind a school teacher very clearly to him, a wonderful teacher of poetry and English literature from years ago who had gone out of her way to put a great love of literature and verse in him. It affected all his writings and his preaching. So he sat down and wrote a letter to this woman, now up in years, and it was only a matter of days until he got a reply in the feeble scrawl of that aged woman. My dear Willie, it started. Stinger says at that time he was about 50 years of age, he was bald, and no one had called him Willie for a long time. And the opening sentence warmed his heart. Here's the letter. My dear Willie, I can't tell you how much your note meant to me. I am in my 80s, living alone in a small room, cooking my own meals, lonely, and like the last eve, leaf of autumn lingering behind. You'll be interested to know that I taught in school for more than 50 years, and yours is the first note of appreciation I ever received. It came on a blue, cold morning, and it cheered me as nothing has done in many years. Just a note to say thanks. And it made a lot of difference. Stinger said, I'm not very sentimental, but I found myself weeping over that note. Then he thought of another, a kindly bishop who was now retired, an old man who had recently faced the death of his wife and was all alone. This bishop had taken a lot of time and given him advice and counsel and love when he first began his ministry. So he sat down and wrote the old bishop, in two days, a reply came back, my dear Will, your letter was so beautiful, so real, that as I sat reading it in my study, tears fell from my eyes, tears of gratitude. Before I realized what I was doing, I rose from my chair and I called her name to share it with her, forgetting she was gone. You'll never know how much your letter has wounded my spirit. I've been walking around in the glow of your letter all day long. Oh, to carefully craft the skill of gratitude. We're prone to grumble and find fault and complain. But it is the Holy Spirit, Martin Luther said, it is the Holy Spirit that teaches us the art of thankfulness. It takes a good measure of humility to say thanks because it acknowledges that someone has done for us something that in many circumstances, many situations we could not do for ourselves and that we appreciate their kindness in our lives. We certainly all owe God a debt of, a debt of gratitude, thankful for what he has done in our lives. Spend some time this week being a thanks giver. And let his Holy Spirit teach you that fine art of giving thanks. Let him show you, let him bring to your mind some people that may need to hear a word of thanks from your heart to theirs. He knows who needs it. And once, he, once he's clued you in as to that person, don't hesitate. Get it to them. Let them know how grateful you are for their impact on your life. Crowder's got a song. I forget the title. Is it Thanksgiver or something like that, I think? So we'll play that just to give you an opportunity to contemplate who that might be or maybe just to use this time to commune with your father about how good he's been to you and express to him your gratitude. And then I'll come back.
remember in Sunday school, it was always safe to answer the question, whatever the question was, with Jesus, right? So, so when somebody says to you, hey, what are you thankful for? You know, we kind of got our go-tos, right? Oh, I'm thankful for family, I'm thankful for this, we're thankful for, get out of the box and let the Holy Spirit teach you the art of giving them thanks. Maybe things that you've never ever been thankful for or expressed your thankfulness for before. He'll do that. All right? Um, one thing I'm thankful for is we've had some extended time with our friend and brother Joe Newcomb. Joe's been here uh, going on a couple of weeks now. He'll be on his way back to New Orleans, on, from there back to Juarez, from there on his way to Ukraine and Romania, etc. just doing what the Lord prompts him to do. And if you'd like to be a part of that uh, mission in any way, uh, financially, we've got the plate up here. You can, you can contribute to Joe's needs that way. If you've got questions, Joe would be happy to talk with you about what God's got him up to lately. All right? Some homework. Um, <clears throat> if you're up to it, before you get out of this room, share with somebody something you're grateful for that you don't think you've ever given word to. And if you can't get it pulled off before you get out of the room, then before you get home, all right, have that conversation in the car on the way home. And certainly before the end of the day, get that done, all right? Because God's been good to us. Amen? Amen. Amen. On your feet, practice with one another, and then let's go be the church. Six o'clock tonight across town. Have a great day.